We are on to Nintendo Power number 103 for December of 1997, with a few games that we've covered before and one very heavily buried lead. Our cover game this issue is Diddy Kong Racing, which I covered last time, so I won't be covering it again here. However, that buried lead lies right at the top of the page, where they are promising the first 100 screenshots of Zelda 64. We have a bunch of letters this issue on GoldenEye 007, along with a letter about the date of the apocalypse in Crystallis coming up. In the power charts, we don't have any new titles this issue, but we do have GoldenEye 007 moving to the top of the charts on the N64, and Zelda holding the top of the charts everywhere else. We have our cover story with more coverage of Diddy Kong Racing to help you get started with the game, with much more in-depth coverage focusing on all the power-ups and a whole bunch of track maps. Again, review this last time. I'll refer you to the previous episode for my thoughts on the game. We don't have a full guide for Zelda 64 yet, but what we do have is a whole bunch of screenshots of the game. These also include some god-freaking-awful combinations of text and background to make some of these chunks borderline legible but they do let you know that you'll be playing both as a young and adult Link, setting up the time uh, mechanic setup for Ocarina of Time. Well, the first game this issue that we will be reviewing is Chameleon Twist, a new mascot 3D platformer from Sunsoft. We get a bunch of level maps from this game, and I've never heard of this game before, so I'm interested to check this out. Chameleon Twist is an odd but interesting mascot platformer from Sunsoft. On the one hand, the game adds a bit of a new mechanic, or new-ish, what has been on the 3D platformer concept by giving the main character a tongue that works sort of like Yoshi's tongue plus Bionic Commando's arm, letting you swing through the levels and reach distant objects, allowing, and also allowing you to have it serve as part of your combat verb by letting you suction up enemies and spit them back out at other opponents. It's particularly impressive because, at least from my gameplay experience, I don't remember a lot of games that really tried stuff with this that didn't well involve Spider-Man during this console generation. That said, the game does run into some real problems with the camera. It's just not quite as good as the camera from Mario 64, both in terms of positioning and in terms of your ability to control it. On several occasions, I found myself taking just a little too long to line up a shot tongue or not being able to spin with the right spin in the right direction or i found myself attempting to do a tongue vault jump that i thought was possible but wasn't something i could actually do because of a level ceiling that blocked how high i could go but i couldn't see that ceiling not a bad game not in the slightest but it's also not a great one it's almost figured out its own take its own spin on the 3d platform concept and i do wonder if a sequel would have taken what they learned from the game's development and they iterated it on it further to make for an even better game. There is a sequel that is out, that, or that came out. Hopefully it'll get covered in Nintendo Power, and if so, we'll discuss it then. Next up is Mortal Kombat Mythology's Sub-Zero, a belt-scrolling beat-em-up with platforming elements which introduced Quan Chi and Chinook to the MK universe. We have notes on a whole bunch of early areas of the game. I knew, going in, that Mortal Kombat Mythology Sub-Zero was bad. I had read reviews across numerous publications at the time of release, contemporaneously, that had given this game bad reviews. Even then, at the back of my mind, as a middle schooler and later high schooler, I thought, this can't be that bad, can it? No, it, it is that bad. In short, Mortal Kombat Mythology Sub-Zero has the really stupid idea of taking the core Mortal Kombat engine, the fighting game system, with all the animations and controls that come with it, and taking all that work that was done for a fighting game and deciding to use all of that existing material to, as the groundwork, the bones and central nervous system behind a cinematic action game like Another World or Prince of Persia. Or problem being that the controls and the engine aren't the right tools for the job. It is very clear as I played the game that Midway was basically trying to rob Peter to pay Paul by finding ways to reuse animations 
and other similar material from the core Mortal Kombat games as much as possible so they didn't have to digitize additional characters. The problem is this led to things like, or for that matter, for having to develop a whole new engine for playing the game is the important thing here in terms of um, handle, how it handles controls, how it handles movement, uh, that sort of thing. And that's the problem is this leads to things like pressing up to jump. Now this is something that I thought that we'd learned back in the 8-bit era and yes that this was a bad idea but no um apparently we or at least midway had not never mind that this is a game that is tur turns out to be actually shockingly essential to the mortal kombat story from the big picture uh this is our first introduction to chinook and quan chi who would be the villains for a significant chunk of the franchise from here um yes even when shang soon comes back in he is teaming up with or subordinate to Quan Chi and Chinook as primary antagonists. So tying all of this to a game, this information to a game like this to expand it is just bad for the, this is the, the material that will be driving our future games going forward because it ultimately serves to, in the long term, to develop, to uh, scare the developer off of expanding the lore in this way, particularly between this and Special Forces. Um, both of which tanked and ultimately meant that we didn't get another game like this until Shaolin Monks, but what was, which was good, very good, but it didn't do well enough to merit other games in this style, admittedly, partially because this game and Special Forces scared a lot of people off of Shaolin Monks because they thought, oh, this is going to be like that other game, like those other two games which is unfortunate. It's time for more hotkey with Gretzky with Wayne Gretzky's 3D Hockey 98. It sounds like it's a lot like the last game except with updated rosters. Well, there are updated rosters and the controls are pretty similar, but there clearly have been some tweaks under the hood with Wayne Gretzky's 3D Hockey 98, particularly when it comes to the Roman banding. Uh, the game feels like it moves faster the controls are incredibly solid, and the defense feels like the balance of the defense feels right. In addition, it doesn't toss a bunch of NBM, NBA Jam S power up stuff in career mode by default, which also is wonderful. Um, it like I didn't feel like when I was scoring goals or trying to play defense that the opposing team was somehow getting better uh, just because I'd done well, which is ultimately what rubber banding should feel like. It, you feel like it rewards good play by keeping a challenge, by keeping the, the opponent as someone who keeps the player on the back foot but also doesn't have the player um, just feeling like they're spinning the wheels and thus not providing opportunities for them to want to develop and improve as a player. So this, this game nails that perfectly, and it makes for a sports game that I like. I like this game a lot more than the first game. In class for information, we have a couple of weird tricks for GoldenEye 007, like duplicate characters in multiplayer and mixing and matching your dual-welded weapons. Next up is Bomberman 64, and we have a strategy guide with all the various weapons and power-ups in the game, along with some new mechanics like the ability to pump up bombs and some level maps. Bomberman 64 has some interesting innovations on the core Bomberman concept. For example, adding the Z-axis to, to the game's levels does change things up dramatically in terms of thinking new puzzles and new ways to use bombs to solve them. Where things fall apart is with the camera and the movement. The camera, as with Mario 64, exists as a physical object in the game's level environment, which means that the game's uh, level geometry and textures can get in the way unless you zoom in the camera enough where it moves through the geometry, except this runs into issues if the level geometry is claustrophobic enough that you just have to keep doing this and you can never really get it in the right place. All this is aggravated by having eight-way movement for you to move through, and also in turn have to kick and 
throw bombs. Feels like the game needed some way to have the camera to just always look through the geometry, since showing the uh, characters alone wouldn't help with throwing bombs with the geometry, since you can be killed by your own bombs. Now, removing the ability to take damage from your own bombs would fix that, at least in single player, but I don't know how well the game tracks launched one bomb. And indeed, part of the game's puzzles in the past have been trying to avoid taking damage from your own bombs, so that would arguably undermining a classic console of the series. Now, when all said and done, Bomberman 64 has the ultimate core issue that we're facing with a lot of 3D games at this period. That people are still trying to figure out how to play these kinds of games. This game clearly was in development while Mario 64 was in development. So they can't necessarily have looked at Mario 64 and used that as something to build off of in terms of designing the game. So they hadn't had a chance to look at someone, something by someone who had figured everything out yet. That's so. In Counselor's Corner, we have some more tips for secondary objectives in GoldenEye 64. Our final game of the issue is a racing game with Automobile, Automobili, Lamborghini, a simulation racer with, as the title suggests, the license for Lamborghini. We have notes on the three game modes, multiplayer modes, and the different kinds of cars you can get. The game also has a pit crew mini game. Uh, and also, so we have notes on that and how it controls, and notes on the, several of the game's tracks. So, Automobili Lamborghini managed to do something that no racing game so far has managed to do. Um, not on the N64, PlayStation, not on uh, the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360, not on the Xbox um, and PlayStation 2, not on modern consoles. Made me motion sick. Now the tracks are okay, the controls are alright, but there's two fatal flaws. So the one that's not specific to me personally, how the rubber banding is or is not implemented. A good racing game will rubber band the difficulty to keep the opposing racers more or less keeping up with the player, to allow the player to catch up the first place, but not blow the first place racer out of the water unless the player has overwhelming skill. I got into this a little bit with talking about Wayne Gretzky's 3D hockey, but it bears repeating. However, here, the game tends to just keep the player at the back of the pack, with some odd exceptions for like a couple tracks where I found opponents just getting hung up on the track geometry and not being able to continue the impression they're trying to keep the best racing line based on what the actual track layout is in terms of the lines but not accounting for odd bits of geometry necessarily it's them getting hung up on the geometry and not being able to progress so that that's not great there with your racing game you should like Again, it's good to have racers keep with the standard racing line and the optimal racing line to serve as something to inspire the player and educate the player on what route they need to be taking through the track, but they shouldn't be perfect all the time. Again, I've covered this before in past racing game reviews, it bears repeating. Again, the other issue is that with several of the tracks, I almost I found myself just sitting on getting my motion sickness um, set off and really badly too. And I'm not like I'm playing in first person either. This is my gameplay session here where I got motion sick that you're looking at right now. And it wasn't so bad that I threw up or anything, but it was enough that I couldn't complete career mode because I, I just couldn't keep going. I needed to stop drink some water and have a light out and that's that's a that's an issue for me right for some people that will be an issue of uh, viewers that will be an issue for you if you have problems with motion sickness while gaming particularly with certain console generations maybe with screen tearing or that sort of thing keep that in mind our last two games the issue are ones that will not be covering particularly because it's Stuff there's not where it's not really a lot to talk about. We have a Wheel of Fortune game for the N64. These are all varying degrees of the same. It's all about like 
the changes between games are a visual presentation and the words and the vocabulary that they use for the Wheel of Fortune titles. So it's it's a reasonable skip. And our single Game Boy game we're getting coverage for this issue is a continuation of the existing coverage of Donkey Kong Land 3, which makes me wonder if at this period of time, the Game Boy release schedule is so thin for new titles or good titles that they have to fall back on just stretching a coverage of this one game out, this one first party game out for as long as possible. In the now pound playing column, we have no also rans, but also Mortal Kombat Mythologies gets damned with faint damnation, including among other things, comparisons with Cop Rock, the TV cop musical sh uh, show from the creator of Hill Street Blues. Anyway, moving on, Packwatch has some coverage of Forsaken, but probably its big feature is the developer profile of Boss Game Studios and their upcoming game, Twisted Edge Snowboarding. My pick of the issue is, to a, that's a significant surprise to me, um, Wayne Gretzky's 3D Hockey 98. Like, I'm surprised as you are that I went with the sports game, but that was a really fun game to play. A Chameleon Twist also was ran as a really close second. Um, as far as the, the game that I'd never heard of before I picked up this issue or started reading this issue for the show. Definitely a case where there are some underrated and little known titles. And yes, I realize the title that fe that calling a title that was featured in Nintendo Power Magazine underrated is a bit silly, but still games that I and probably other people haven't heard of that are still out there and probably still fairly affordable to pick up. Uh, at the time of this recording, I checked eBay. The first game runs about 30 bucks. There is a sequel, by the way. It does run a little more. It may have also had a smaller print run. But in any case, that's a pretty reasonable game. I I enjoyed playing it, and I'm definitely looking forward to the sequel. I may even pick up a physical copy for my own rather than just going for the one in... Um, for a digital, using a digital copy. And that's all for the first period. The Mighty Ducks, zero. The Canucks, one. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. I also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and in future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.